as Derek said, my name is Mira, and I interned with Virginia Gap in Virginia this summer. Um, so, let's get started. I'll give a quick overview. There's Richard right there in the <laughs> room. Um, so he's the founder and CEO, and his partner, Dallas Bell, is the executive officer. Um, Virginia Gap in Virginia has been operating since 2009, and they do criminal justice, the short of justice services. Um, they do comprehensive pre- and post- release uh, restorative justice to returning citizens. And a part of that, their goals are to provide uh, opportunities for a healthy, uh, healthy wholesome lifestyle um, following release from incarceration. And uh, Richard does workshops with the Office of Community Wealth Building in the downtown Richmond. Um, and he's also helped restore the rights of over 6,000 individuals with the new Virginia legislation that allows formerly incarcerated convicted felons to gain their rights back if they've completed all, the rights, uh, all of their rules. Um, so for 10 years, they've been doing criminal justice, but more recently there's an environmental justice initiative, and that's part of what I was helping out with this summer. Um, and what I did was mostly grant writing, administrative support, and technological support. I did their website, and their brochure, or a few grants. Um, and sort of anything else that was needed because I was the only intern and it's a small organization. So, um, To understand my summer, you would have to understand Union Hill, as I realized. Um, Union Hill is in Buckingham County, Virginia. It's a community of um, formerly enslaved people in the pre-Civil War era. This land was a tobacco plantation. Um, and in the late 1800s, parcels of the land were sold to the people who were formerly enslaved by the plantation owner, and the descendants still live on the land today. So it's a historical landmark, and uh, the connection there is that Richard's great-great-grandfather, Taylor Harper, was one of those um, freedmen in the freedmen community that is still called Union Hill today, and there is their family homestead. Um, and the bad news and the reason why my internship was related to Union Hill this summer is a very timely issue of Dominion Energy trying to put a pipeline through the land and take some of his family's land, claiming eminent domain. And I don't want to get too political, but a lot of this was um, related to that struggle with Dominion Energy. And it's been a years long fight and it's held up in the courts. So. A lot of what I was doing was also helping to bring recognition to Union Hill, um, which we did. So here's the Union Hill Community Social over here. It's a picture of everyone. And that's Yogaville, Virginia, which is about 10 minutes away. Um, and a lot of the residents of Yogaville went to the Community Social, which was a kickoff for the solar installation training that we had. Um, there were 10 participants. This was the first one of its kind. Um, and another part of what we were doing was looking for unmarked burial plots in the land that they were trying to claim eminent domain in, and we found some, and this was just a really cool, super old wine bottle that we found. Um, so it's interesting to see all the old artifacts in the land. Um, and after the Union Hill Community Social, the next week we had the solar installation training. And down here is everyone that participated in the training, the graduates, here is, we had a graduation ceremony, and there's the IREC master trainer, Sean White, with White House Solar. And so he did the training for everyone, and it was 40 hours, and they have NABSEP certification and are now getting jobs with solar installation companies. So here, I think it's half formerly incarcerated, and then Richard also went through the training, one of the other former University of Richmond student grant, um, and some members of the community all took part in this training. Um, so that was the big event of the summer. And then now on to my academic portion. Um, I read several other articles and newspaper clippings that related to what I was studying, but the main book that I based my research off of was This Changes Everything by Naomi Klein. And this whole idea of change or be changed and how the climate crisis is going to change the world in one way or the other, so either you can change to prevent that or you will be changed in the end anyway. Um, so I wanted to, these are a few quotes from the book that really stuck out to me. 
Never mind what this war on carbon means to the very premise of global free trade with insistence that geographical distance is mere fiction to be collapsed by Walmart's diesel trucks and Mayor's container ships. So this stuck out to me because I was thinking about the idea of wanting to be 100% renewable in everything you do and just the idea and the tension between you can have the best intentions in the world, in the world um, and still not fully live up to your mission because of the reality of the world and how things work. So the inability to be carbon neutral when shipping supplies and transportation and everything else that either directly or indirectly relates to an issue that you're trying to have at. So the contradiction between the hopes and then what is actually feasible um, and organ organizations promoting green energy being entirely green, it's sort of a kind of impossible, at least for now, in the world we live in, um, which was, yeah. And so my for my academic portion, it wasn't traditional research with a question and an answer, um, but it more just gave me a new lens through which I looked at issues that I already knew existed. So the idea of dirty money. Relationships are also more structural than your donations and partnerships. The Nature Conservancy, which is an environmental agency, counts BP America, Chevron, and Shell, among the members of its business council, and Jim Rogers, chairman of the board and former CEO of Duke Energy, one of the largest U.S. coal burning utilities, sits on the organization's board of directors. Um, so connected organizations and associations with questionable practices and questionable origins of where the money comes from, and at what point would you not accept money because its origins or take it anyway because you need it? Um, and here's just a short clip that explains the book. The majority of the human race does not see global warming as a serious threat. Celebrate! Climate legislation is dead. We, in the global north, with less than 20% of the population, are responsible for over 70% of global emissions. We are drilling all over the place. Environmental injustice have the least responsibility for creating this crisis in the first place. The amount of fossil fuel that we're combusting year on year is growing. We're going in completely the wrong direction. I've spent six years wandering through the wreckage caused by the carbon in the air and the economic system that put it there. That old paradigm will be forced to change, either by the environment around us or by us. We are all part of this movement! You see communities who are thrown into the front line. You see the incredible transformation. They become stronger, they stand up. So here's the big question. What if global warming isn't only a crisis? What if it's the best chance you're ever going to get to build a better world? Change or be changed? There are limits. Let's celebrate the limits because we can reinvent a different future. So, um, one of the things they said is the people that are most affected are the least responsible. And in one of the other readings I did, it also added, and they're furthest away from power to change that. Um, so, some of the lacks in the literature um, what does this mean for a small grassroots nonprofit organization? trying to combat these issues. Um, and, you know, these effects of climate change aren't just happening on the other side of the world. It's happening in the U.S., it's happening in Virginia, and it's happening right outside of Richmond. Um, and it's easy to turn a blind eye to it when it's not directly in your community, but these communities in the state and in the country and around the world 
are affected by these issues and are furthest away from the power to change that. Um, so Naomi Klein says that it might be an opportunity, and that's one of the um, sort of missions behind this growing environmental justice initiative of bridging the gap in Virginia um, of green workforce development. So you know, taking marginalized communities or formerly incarcerated individuals who have who struggle to find jobs because of the way that the laws are and the way that the structure the structure of the system works, and then taking these issues of you know the lack of renewable energy and wanting to promote renewable energy and combining them into one idea of green workforce development. Um, and then, yeah, so it was just a new lens through which I saw these issues. I didn't answer any questions this summer, and I still have very many. Um, but yeah, so that's the academic component of what I did this summer. And then I just wanted to end with a few pictures. Uh, this is also from the community social. We were drawing safe energy pictures and made bracelets with uh, PV sensitive beads that would change color in the sun. Um, and there's Richard being interviewed, filmed for something. And that's when we found the limit of disturbance compressor station stake uh, in the ground on his family land. Uh, thank you to everyone at CCE and especially Richard for being so inspiring and dedicated this summer and for everything you do.